Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Riverfront. This is episode number 448 of the world's most dangerous podcast. I'm your host, Chad Dotson. This is the podcast where we discuss the Cincinnati Reds and occasionally Asher Wojciechowski. Joining me this week, once again, your friend and mine. He's not actually my friend. I, he, I'm required to uh, spend time with him. It's Nate Dotson. How are you, Nate? Legally obligated to claim me as his own. I am fantastic. You know, it's a it's nice light tonight when I'm glad that we uh, we don't go live all the time because I think people were expecting us to be ready at eight o'clock when we expected to be ready. This would have been a whole situation, but we're here. <laughs> I'm a glass or two of wine deep. I'm feeling good. A little frog, a little Hunter S. Thompson slash sleep hygiene vibe going on right now for those of you on YouTube. Let's do this. I'm ready to get into some viewer mail questions. Yeah, if you're not watching on YouTube, you don't know what you're missing, Nate. I love the the Gonzo Hunter S. Thompson look. It's fantastic. Keep it up. Um, I don't ha quite have that, but uh, we will talk a, a little bit later about what I am wearing. Uh, this is uh, the Riverfront, right? Now, I want to before we go any further, I want to ask you if you are watching on YouTube, and you, first of all, you've already hit the like button, I'm sure, and, and smashed that subscribe button if you saw Nate. Uh, if you're listening to the audio version, why not give us a subscribe, follow us, whatever it does at your podcast app. Um, and have the, my dulcet tones delivered to your phone every single week. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, everywhere, whatever, wherever you get your podcasts. Literally, we're there. Audible. Have you ever heard of Audible, Nate? Absolutely. It's a big audiobook yeah. fan. Huge audiobook fan. The Riverfront's on Audible now. Uh, download Whoa. us for free. And then, oh, quickly, the show would not be possible with the, without the support of our Patreon family. So um, just want to thank, uh, thank those guys at patreon.com. Slash Riverfront Cincy. Nate, you mentioned it a moment ago. We promised it last week. It's an all viewer mail episode. Can you quantify how excited you are for an all viewer mail episode? Listen, we are going to be getting into some weird stuff. I saw some of the questions. You made the mistake of putting it out there on Twitter that we're doing this. Usually it's just the Patreon family if it's its own family because they treat you like family in there. And Twitter, they don't treat you like family. <laughs> it's true. So we, it's might, true. we might get into how our sock drawers are going to, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but these are my absolute favorite episodes to film. I love getting into it. You know, it's the off season for Reds fans. Playoff baseball is going on. It's hot in the streets, but in Cincinnati, it's a little bit cooler. Fall is setting in. So we got to do what we can to, uh, you know, contribute to the airwaves. Well, you know, I, I, I agree. I, I love the idea of doing a viewer mail episode only. Um, occasionally because they are always fun they always go off the rails and I, I earlier today after i'd kind of sent that out on on the twitters um i got a text from nate and said oh man i, I have a feeling this one's going to go way off the rails uh, pr pretty quickly because some of the questions are great usually with these viewer mail episodes and if you're if you're a long time listener you know this uh this dumb viewer mail thing that we do years ago because because I was looking to fill up, so I think I believe it started. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not remembering this correctly. But it, I believe it started during the uh, the COVID shutdown, and Ooh. I needed to fill some time. So I said, "We're going to do some viewer mail." It may have been, it probably was before that. Someone will go back in the archives and tell me. But uh, I know it certainly became a a, a a weekly segment. Easy for me to say a weekly segment on the show around that time because we got such great questions and we ended up getting so many uh, that as, as you noted week to week, the questions are generally from our friends at Patreon uh, because we just don't have enough time for everyone. But that's what I like about this expansive viewer mail only episode. There's not a lot of reds news this week to talk about. So we can open it up to the rest of you. Uh, obviously we'd love to have you come join the, the Patreon family, but you don't have to, this show's free every week for everyone. And, um, uh, you know, we encourage you to, uh, to to join us on this road. I don't know. I've, I've vamped enough here. I think we need to <laughs> dive into the questions. Don't you think, Nate? We don't have anything else on the agenda other than to dive into these questions. So I'm ready. <laughs> That's right. Um, oh, by the way, there's baseball going on this week. It, it's still happening. I just thought we should note that. I'm not going to lie to you. I've watched more baseball in the past seven days than I had in the previous 30. <laughs> I know, man. Uh, I, again, we're not talking about the baseball of this week, but I got to say, just as soon as I start cheering for the Mariners, <laughs> they go and start breaking my heart. They are one Jordan Alvarez away from being up 2 0 right now. I know. It, makes, it makes my heart hurt. I'm just believing, though, that they're going to win the next three because I remember a time, perhaps 
Perhaps it was 10 years ago this month when the Reds won uh, the first two uh, games in a division series and then lost the next three. Um, sorry, gang. First question for from viewer mail um, is actually one that was left over from last week. If you listen to last week's episode, uh, first of all, if you didn't listen to last week's episode, where were you? Come on. Um, but this was a question we just didn't have time to get into. We wanted to kind of expound on it a little bit because it's a really good question, a really fun question in some ways. It's a different way to look at this typical question of constructing a team. If you had to put together a team. And this question comes from our friend Calvin Medcalf. Calvin says, hey, guys, a bit of a different question for y'all today. I like that he actually said y'all because he knew that I would be reading it. And it, so I'm it, saying we're rubbing ridiculous off. Accent. Yeah, well, it's ridiculous Southern accent. Just It sounds right. So thanks, Calvin. Um, if you had to construct a team right now, he actually said, if you had to construct a team, RN. But see, I, I know the lingo of the kids these days. I'm hip. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I couldn't even say that with a straight face. I'm, I'm not hip. If you had to construct a team right now, but could only use players from teams who finished last in their division, what would that team look like? How many of our beloved Reds would make it on? And do you think they could finish with a better record than the actual Reds this season? Cheers for playing the hypothetical. And of course, we didn't have time last week's episode. Somehow, the last episode of the regular season, we went longer than we'd gone in weeks because uh, I don't know, we were having a lot of fun. And so, but we didn't have time for this one. So uh, let me set the stage. The last place teams Colorado, Washington, Cincinnati, and Pittsburgh tied for last. So we're going to use both of them. Oh, uh, you, you didn't do that, huh? I, I they tied officially. The Reds actually were the last okay. place team because of the tiebreaker, but I included Pittsburgh for one reason that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. Um, actually, two reasons. Kansas City, Oakland, and Boston. Those are the last place teams. So, Nate, you know, you you did this last week. You constructed your, uh, your, your roster last week. How do you do it? I, I was thinking we can name some starting pitchers, one relief pitcher or two, and then a starter in each position. We can't do a full 40-man uh, you know, sure. yeah. roster. I didn't go too deep into the pitchers. I definitely knew that I would take a couple of the Reds' young guys. Um, the Pittsburgh wild card throws a slight wrench, but looking at uh, some of your selections here, I think only one position would have been affected for me. Yeah, um, I know which position you're talking about. To answer one part of Calvin's question, yes, this team would destroy the Reds. <laughs> they would have beaten the brakes off the 2022 Cincinnati Reds. Uh, yeah, no question, actually. And you can put together a pretty good team, actually. Pretty surprising. darn good team. Yeah. Yeah, like a playoff team, probably. Uh, or close, anyway. Certainly a competitive team. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, if you're taking from seven major league teams, surely you could put together one good team, even if they're the seven worst teams in baseball. And these actually aren't necessarily the seven worst teams in baseball. They're the seven last place teams. Um, so, Nate, you want to start with starting pitchers? Let's just go with that. Sure. I'm going to toss up the young Reds, guys. Give me give me Hunter Green, Nickel Dolo. And, I mean, if we're just going by, based on stats alone, Graham Ashcraft's probably in there. But I'm, going to, I'm going to say Green and Lodolo because I think that you know, any team is going to want those guys in their rotation, especially the way they finish up the year. Now, we're starting out with being Reds homers here, uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I looked through the starting rotations of each of these teams, and if, I, you know, if I'm going to make – uh, f have a five-man rotation, I, I think I do take Green Lodolo. Again, the question is constructing a team right now. Well, first of all, you got Green Lodolo. Lodolo was one of maybe the third, fourth, fifth best pitcher of any of these teams uh, in, yeah. by, by the stats, you can argue. And, of course, Green is Green. So, yeah, I want those guys for the next few years. Uh, so, I don't think that's being a homer. I think Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo, absolutely. I would actually flip the order, Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green, based on their performance this year. But I would take them. Uh, here's the next the, the next guy I would take off the top is another young guy that I think just would – you put him with uh, Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, and, uh, you know, it's looking like an awfully good rotation already. And that's Brady Singer from the uh, Kansas City Royals. That's the, that's the other young guy. I think he's 25 years old. That's the other young guy I would add. Who else yeah, you got, Nate? Anyone? There's another young guy that I think warrants mentioning. His name is Zach Greinke. Yeah, he's a bit of a spring chicken. <laughs> not, not exactly proven himself in the big leagues yet. But um, yeah, you, I think I feel like he was sort of an afterthought. Yeah, you, know, you forget about him in Kansas City. He's been great his whole career, and he had a pretty solid year this year too. He did not his best year, obviously, but sure. um, 
It's also a weirdo. Like, and I, I like weirdos. He, he is. He, uh, he's Zach Grinky, and he is. Uh, he's gonna. He's gonna give lots of good quotes. You know. Um, the only other guy maybe I would mention here is I think I would. Uh, he didn't have as good a year this year, but he's made All Star team a couple times for the uh, the Red Sox, and that's Nathan Avaldi. I think probably. Um, but but if, if your rotation is Singer, Green, Lodolo, Grinky, and Avaldi, that's that's pretty solid starting five right there. I mean. Lodolo or Green are probably your number five starter there. Bring it on. I'd also like to salute your pronunciation of Avaldi. Like, off the cuff there, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm so bad with names. I need, I need to practice in front of a mirror for at least 20 minutes before every show. But yeah, I promise, me starting you, five. promise me you'll, you'll wear that hat as you as you practice in front of the mirror. Only but we're off to a good you. start. <laughs> we're off to a good start. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so, so you got a team right now that okay, they're going to be competitive because they're going to have a good starting pitcher on the mound every every day uh, all through the, the rotation. So let's move on to uh, to catcher now. And catcher, you know, I, are we being a homer again? But I think I take there is there is an argument to be made uh, for another catcher. But I think I probably take Tyler Stevenson. Am, am I wrong? If I'm constructing this team before the 2022 season begins, I'm 100% taking Tyler Stevenson. But if I'm basing this team on the production that they had in 2022, injuries have to play into that. And I think you got to go with Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy had the best season of all the catchers on these teams. Yeah, well, you know, and that's the other guy that, I again, I had to try to talk myself into. Do I really want to? Take Tyler Stevens over Sean Murphy. Sean Murphy played in 148 games. I mean, um, just uh, yeah, 120 OPS plus, 18 homers. Uh, and I don't know if he said it. Too. <laughs> What's that? He's got a big dumper too. Packing. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, he's Oakland's uh, catcher, and um, of course, obviously, he uh, DH'd uh, 30 times. Actually, Oakland. Can I just say this? Oakland used him, and he's 27. You know, he's a He's a guy that's going to be productive for a few years, I think. Oakland used him exactly like I wanted the Reds to use Tyler Stevenson, which is that um, he caught 116 games, but then he DH'd another 30. Uh, do you remember how frustrated we were early in the year that uh, Tyler Stevenson was not DHing or playing first base on the days that he wasn't yeah. catching? And, um, and I know David Bell's coming back, but if you want to make an argument for why David Bell should not come back as manager, to me, that's right up at the top. The A's – Clearly ahead of the game. <laughs> they did, they're such a good team. Uh, but they did model, they at least use franchise. Sean Murphy well. <laughs> model franchise. Uh, but, you know, they use Murphy correctly. Am I Am I, Am I? I right or am I right? You didn't leave me many options there, so I'm going to go with you. You're right. It's easier when so, you are, though. Absolutely. Now, I guess the only other person that I would maybe mention here, although I don't, you know, I mean, he's, he had a good year this year, um, but it's Salvador Perez. For uh, Kansas City, and I mentioned him. You know, he's 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 thirty two, be thirty three next year. He, he did hit forty eight home runs last year. He's a seven time All Star. He's won how many Gold Gloves here? Um, five Gold Gloves. You kind of have to have him in the in the conversation, even though he's well, aging a little bit. But I think because he's aging a little bit, I think I go with one of the young guys. I'm starting a team. I had uh, Salvador Perez elsewhere in my lineup because we need a DH. Ah, stick a pin in that. I didn't have. I, was my still, starting DH. Well, I'm, I'm going to sign on to that then because I'm still pre uh, 2022 National League. I don't accept the DH. I don't even acknowledge it. <laughs> All right. First base. First base. What do you got for, at first base, Nate? First base, I went with CJ Crone from Colorado. Interesting. Yeah. And. The stats were good, and he also just played well in big moments. I think he, he strikes me as a clutch guy. I don't know if it's true or not. I just have that feeling about it because I do feelings, no facts. I'm not looking this up. I don't know what his batting average was with runners in scoring position. But I feel like he had a really good season, and he's got an awesome name. I like that. Yeah, I, uh, I think you're wrong. Um, can I just, it happens. Can I just it say happens. That explicitly? Um, Once or twice. Uh, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a good choice. 29 homers, 102 RBIs. Hard to argue with that. I went with another Oakland A because I love them Oakland A's. I love me some Oakland Athletics. 
Seth Brown, 25 homers, 73 RBIs, 115 OPS plus. Uh, I don't know. I, I, that, that's who I went with. I, I think if we're – when I did this, I really struggled because like in – uh, you know, in the outfield, I wanted to put Juan Soto. At first base here, I wanted to put Josh Bell. You know, uh, there was someone else I think that I had in my list that I really wanted to put in there. And uh, unfortunately, they were traded late in the year. But uh, Brandon Drury might be, might, might have been in there. You know, Luis Castillo sure. definitely would have been in there. So, so we're going to have to split on that one. Now, we'll take uh, yours Seth, on that. Seth, one. Seth Brown's a fine choice. I just don't like him as much. And I'm the manager, so I get to make these decisions. Good point. Good point. And CJ Crone is a much cooler name. So, all right, we're going with you on that one. Second base. All right, here's where I start being an, uh, a homer again. But I think there's a pretty good argument for Jonathan India here. Uh, I, I look forward to everyone telling me how stupid I am after they listen to this. But there's only one other person that I felt like was even in the conversation, Nate. What do you think about second base? Um, I think you and I probably had the same two choices, Jonathan India and Trevor Story. Um, yes. I mean, if you're if you're constructing a team, give me Jonathan India all day because of those contracts. I'd much rather have Jonathan India in his sophomore campaign than Trevor Story in that giant free agent deal he got from Boston. And Trevor Story, you know, had some had some stretches, but he really didn't play all that well this year. He was hurt a lot. He was banged up. So it was India. So I don't I don't think it's a homer pick. I think if you have both those guys on your roster, Story plays a little shortstop too. Maybe I don't know, but Jonathan India is firmly in the conversation. Yeah, well, the question is, are you if you're constructing a team? And so for the next five years, I want Jonathan India. India did struggle yeah. this year. Um, some of that's due to injury. Some of that's due to – I don't know what it's due to. Too much partying at Bengals games, maybe. Um, but uh, but I don't know. Uh, again, we are homers. <laughs> we're, we're Reds fans. But, you know, two starting pitchers, the uh, catcher potentially – Maybe not, but and the second base. I think you have pretty good arguments so for all those, but those are all the young stars for the Red. So we, we're not going to talk about that much the rest of the way. But the last place teams, yes, exactly. Um, you know, who we didn't mention at first base. I do, jo- Joseph Daniel Vado. Man, I wanted to, I tried to figure out how. Okay, I'm retroactive, still- Joey Vado first base. Done. There we go, Joey. We Votto. split it. See, every position that we split, we just put Joey Vado there. Yeah, you literally took C.J. Crone over Joey Votto. I'm really embarrassed. You picked somebody's second grade best friend, <laughs> Seth Brown. Yeah, nobody's ever heard of that guy. I'm not even sure he actually exists. Um, third base. I only had one choice here, Nate. Did you have anyone else? I thought it was this was a slam dunk. Who did you have at third base? I thought the same thing for third base and shortstop. Uh, Raphael Devers. Yeah, uh, yeah, he was that, that dude insane. Yeah, no, he's he's legit. He should play for a good team sometime. Looking at their infield, it's amazing that they were last place in their division. I mean, it was a good division. Don't get me wrong, but man, they had some, they had some sluggers. Well, Trevor Story at second base, who you know we're arguing uh, should maybe be the second base on this team. Third base, uh, Raphael Davers, and uh, shortstop. I think we both agree, Xander Bogarts. Uh, clearly, right? No, I, I, I mean, both these guys were not just all star level, but best in Major League Baseball at their position caliber. Right. Now, uh, let me say this, though. Not even close, but there are two guys that I wanted to mention at shortstop because um, we're constructing a team. And I still want Bogart. So Bogart's 29 now. I mean, it's not like he's old. I still want him. But, you know, I, O'Neal Cruz for Pittsburgh, that guy is intriguing as can be. I mean, he's he's what, you know, he's he's the, the first version of L.A. De La Cruz. Um, and Bobby Witt. From Kansas City, whose dad was a mercurial pitcher. Look that one up, mercurial pitcher. Um, but Bobby Witt, you know, a couple of kids who have really, really bright futures. But I, I still, I think you're, I think you're taking Sander Bogarts and sticking him in the middle of your lineup. Yeah, I think All you're right. right too. And Devers over there is only twenty five. Right, right. Outfield, you know, let's go start with the let's start with left field. I think it's pretty obvious. There's only one choice here. It is um, T.J. Friedel. Duh. <laughs> Who's left field? There are no left fielders, Nate. So I actually went with Seth Brown because he played some left field. He played a good bit of left field this year. Okay, so we have, we're getting creative here. So yeah. we're getting, we're going to let Crone have first base so we can put Brown in left field. I like this. I Andrew, like this because there really weren't many great options. Andrew Benintendi, that's the guy I had. 
And then, oh, oops, wait a minute. He didn't finish the year with a with a last place team. So, um, all right, center field, center outfield's field. This pretty, is, outfield's pretty rough, man. The outfit is rough except for center field. I think center field, there's legit. Left field and right field, there's nobody. Um, but center field um, is uh, Brian Reynolds for Pittsburgh. I mean, he's an all-star. He's he's a legitimately uh, good player. And so I don't have any problem. I would love to have Brian Reynolds in center field for Cincinnati. Uh, yes, yes, please and thank you. And um, then right field, you know, maybe Randall Grichik, uh for, for the Rockies, maybe. But even he was, isn't. I don't know. Aristides Aquino. What do you think, Nate? So I'm glad that you allow the Pirates into this because Brian Reynolds is definitely the answer. Um, I went with Michael Taylor from Kansas City, and he had a below 100 OPS plus. So it was slim pickings. So I think we just go with Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. Oh, Ryan Reynolds. Let's have Ryan Reynolds. Deadpool? Deadpool in the outfield? I'm into it. Van Wilder? Ooh, yes. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is delightful. Anyone says otherwise can fight me. Free Guy, this uh, this movie that came out recently, was not uh, received well by critics. Hilarious. So underrated. Quick story underrated. about that. I was oh, excellent. one of the longest, most just tiresome work days of my existence. And I don't remember what day of the week it was, but I was texting my fiance. I'm like, hey, let's go to the movies tonight. We both love the theater. It's back open post pandemic. Let's do this. And she says, well, what do you want to go see? And I said, I don't know. You pick. Or at least give me some options. Give me something to work with here. Time goes by. I don't hear from her. I don't hear from her. Finally, I says, hey, what, you know, what are you thinking? What do you want to go see? She goes, oh, I, I've already made a choice. And I said, okay, well, like, tell me what it is so that I can get excited. You know, I want to. I want to get pumped as I'm here pulling up carpet in this house for the rest of the day. She refuses to tell me. I get home after an hour and a half drive, and I am told we're watching Free Guy. And she just saw me deflate. She's like, "I, I wait. I've spent all this day. I've been about seven hours trying to get excited to watch a movie, and you sneakily got us tickets to Free Guy. And it wasn't my best moment. It wasn't. You know, I, I did not tap into my stoic, you know, practices." I was unhappy. You're going to have well, to get used to, as a as a married person, you're going to have to get used to just internalizing it and going along with it, man. This is true. The long story short, we get there, and I had to eat all of the crow. Free guy. Free guy. It was hilarious. It was beautiful. I almost teared up a couple times. It was and delightful. I to, and I had to apologize a couple times. So oh, good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you were man enough to do that. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is one of these guys that uh, I have season tickets for. Uh, you know, uh, I, when I when I talk about I have season tickets for, like you know, Martin Scorsese, I've got season tickets. Mm-hmm. I'll go to see any movie he makes. You know, Ryan Reynolds, I'll go see any movie he makes. Yep. You know, uh, you know, there, there's a number of people in that category. Jason Statham. Bring it on. I'll Ooh. see any, anything that Jason said in, so except for I agree with that. I'm surprised to hear. Oh, that's what I'm saying. I'm surprised to hear you say that. <laughs> the Rock had I'm, me until Jungle Cruise. He lost me at Jungle Cruise. Not good. Not good. Which had Emily Blunt, who I will still go see everything. She's. I, I'm not sure I have season tickets, but I, I think at this point I might have season tickets for Emily Blunt. Yes, she's a, she's fantastic in everything. Box seats. You know, you know what I my my uh, we're, we're again. You you predicted it. We're going off the rails here. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube, I've uh, I've changed hats as well. Um, Emily Blunt. My, my here. My idea is this: Amazon now has the rights to the James Bond franchise. They purchased mm-hmm. uh, that. So, um, what I think they need to do is we need an extended James Bond universe. And they're picking the next 007 now. I don't know who that's going to be. You know, five years ago, I would given anything for it to be Idris Elba. Now I don't know who it's going to be. I'm hearing rumors of Tom Hardy, but I don't even know if that's going to, uh, maybe his time has passed as well. But what I want to see is they need to do, have a 008 series franchise. Mm. Let Emily Blunt be 008. She would be amazing. She'd crush it. If you, as a British secret agent? Mm-hmm. Bring it on. If you've never seen Edge of Tomorrow, watch that. And it's impossible to disagree with that statement. I watched that movie uh, recently. Now on the, uh, on the flight back from uh, from Austin, we talked about. It. I watched Age of Tomorrow. Man, incredible! Tom Cruise, That's so good. Yeah. All right. So, uh, do you have a right fielder for this team? 
Um, I actually, and I put some thought into this. I went with Jake Fraley. Yes. The other options just were oh, not right. very good at baseball. And Jake Fraley, while no all star, and he was banged up and stuff, but he was the best at hitting baseballs of all these guys. And he plays a solid defense, too. I didn't feel great about it, but based on the options, I don't think there was much of another choice. Randall Grachik is, is, is a fine choice. Well, you know, I put, yeah, I put Grichik in there, but my, my, my notes say, I think so, yes. Um, my, my notes say, maybe M A A A Y B E, Randall Grichik. Um, but now that you mentioned that, you know, I didn't even look at the Reds because I looked, I thought about right field in my mind and I thought Aristides Aquino. Um, I think we put Jake Fraley out there. I think, yeah, I think he is the choice yeah. here. Uh, relief pitchers, there were only two that I thought merited mention from us. One's the hometown guy where I'm going to be a homer again, and that's Alexis Diaz. Um, there was one other that I thought was an obvious choice, but who did, who else did you have? I didn't. I did not dive deep into relief pitching. Okay, so well, oh, Daniel Bard, Jeffrey Hoffman. Oh gosh, Jeffrey Hoffman, the king. Not Jeff. Yes. Jeffrey Not Jeff. His, no, alter, his alter ego Jeff was banished to the nether regions. Daniel Bard from Colorado did not realize what a good year he had. Just an outstanding season for those Rockies. All right. So that's Nate. We we're we're 26 minutes in here. And we have finished one viewer mail question. Welcome to the first six hour episode <laughs> of the <laughs> Red no, Calf. That one took a lot more uh fleshing out than, than the rest of them might. Yeah, we'll be able to do uh, not the rapid fire, but a lot quicker for the rest of these. I blame Calvin Medcalf for asking such a good question. Next question comes from our friend Brian Bowdy. Brian asks this question, who would win a seven-game series between the 1982 and 2022 teams playing with their September rosters? And who would be the MVP of the series? Okay, now that's oh, he picks 82 and 2022, obviously, because those are the only two teams in Reds history to have lost more than 100 games. Nate, did you know that this year's team uh, lost lost 100 games? Yeah, I did. I was rooting for 101, baby. Oh, man, me too. Tattoo I was watch. Not, yeah, tattoo watch. That's right. Is tattoo watch still on? They lose 100, uh, what are we saying, 102 games again next year? That, that mm-hmm. oh, We're still going, that what I said? Lose 102 games. New tattoo. Got to have hope. Why would I get a tattoo on this gorgeous skin? <laughs> Why would I defile myself with a tattoo, Nate? My alabaster prince. I'm telling you. Why would I do that? Oh, maybe <laughs> you all can't see up here. Um, next question comes from Brian Bowdy. Good question, Brian. Um, now, this is a little tough one. Because you, you said playing with the September really, rosters. I want to say something really quickly. Sure. I didn't spend a single moment on this question. Because I knew that you would get such a kick out of it that it would be impossible for me to contribute anything worthwhile. So go. All right, it's all me. Uh, it's true. I, you know, I, he said playing with our September rosters. I try to think. Well, how am I going to quantify who all was on the roster and how we're going to do that? And so what I decided to do was pick September fifteenth. September fifteenth of each season, nineteen eighty two and twenty twenty two. And let's just look at the game they played on that day. Let's use that lineup. Let's uh, and let's see who who has the better team. So, uh, the 2022 Reds played the St. Louis Cardinals and actually won three to two on um, September 15th. The 1982 Reds played the San Francisco Giants. By the way, go look up the San Francisco Giants logo from 1982. It is both glorious and hideous. I don't understand it. Um, the the Giants won that game five to four. Actually, a big. Uh, Scored two runs in the bottom of the eighth uh, to to go ahead. So let's look at the lineups here quickly. Left fielder, TJ Friedel. Went one for four that day, but left fielder for the 82 Reds, Gary Reedus. I'm sorry, I'm going with Gary Reedus on this one, if you all remember Gary Reedus. Um, He's great on Walking Dead. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Uh, and again, I'm going in the order of the 2022 Reds lineup. Second base for the Reds that day, Jonathan India. Second baseman for the Reds in 1982 on that day was Ron Oster. Now, 
That's Reds Hall of Famer Ron Oster, who went two for four with uh, two RBIs that day. Reds Hall of Famer Ron Oster. I'm going with Jonathan India. Oh, okay. that one. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, Ron Oster. You know, I liked Ron Oster growing up. Mostly because he was, I've mentioned this before, but it cracked, every time I think of him, I think about that 1984 Topps baseball card where it had the team leaders in ERA and batting average. And Mario Soto, team leader with a, I don't know, 2.98 ERA or something. And Ron Oster, leading batting average, 267. Not good. Not good. Not great, Bob. All right, next for the Reds, shortstop that day. So we didn't get a Barrero shortstop day in, in on the day that I picked. It's Kyle Farmer. Shortstop for the Reds in 1982, the legend, Davey Concepcion. Sorry, Kyle Farmer. Sorry, Davey. Oh, you, you, whoa. Okay, okay, okay. Now, this was an aging Davey Concepcion, although he continued to play uh, until I think 1988, but I'm still going with Davey Concepcion. Um, Whatever. I'm going <laughs> to. I know Kyle Farmer's the go, but I'm, I'm looking here. You know, Dave Concepcion made nine All Star t- games. Um, won the MVP of the All-Star game one year. Uh, five gold gloves. 1982, the year we're talking about, uh, he was an All-Star, and he was a, he won the Silver Slugger as well. So, yeah, we're going Dave Concepcion. Absolutely. Sorry, Kyle Farmer, you jerk. Kyle Farmer has watched more All-Star games than Dave Concepcion played. <laughs> that might be true. I don't even know if that's true, actually. For the Reds, uh, not 2022, Jake Fraley was the designated hitter for the 1982 Reds. I can't find a designated hitter for some reason, so but so that goes that goes to Jake Fraley. Well, maybe can we can we uh, give uh, Cesar Cedeno, who was a pinch hitter that day? Can we use him? I mean, you're the host. What about, you do whatever you want. <laughs> what about late inning uh, double switch replacement Johnny Bench? Ooh, now we're in talking. 1982. Let's get crazy. He might have been the DH. He was double switched into the game uh, late in the game. I don't know why Johnny Bench wasn't starting. So we're going to go with Johnny Bench as the DH. Sorry, yeah, Jake Fraley. Sure, yeah. First base for the Little Reds <laughs> in 2022, Donovan Solano. I barely remember Donovan Solano. Uh, he exists, right? I'm not going to lie. I remember him fondly. <laughs> there you go. Bring it on. For the Reds, 1982, Dan Dreesen. Reds Ooh. Hall of Famer, Dan Dreesen. Interesting. What, there. what what were Dreesen's numbers that year, though? Because Donovan Solano had a good year when he got healthy and came back. Um, I agree. I, I mocked Donovan Solano, and I, I, I have no issues with him. That year, Dan Dreesen was uh, 30 years old. His OPS plus was 119, 269 okay, average, 368 on base, um, <laughs> say, 17 say homers. Him. Yeah, yeah. Dreesen is way better. Dreesen's just an underrated player. I mean, I was, people don't remember him say, because he. I know very little about Dan Dreesen. Like he, he yeah. might need to be near the, at or near the top of any most underrated Reds list. It's true. No, he. he um, people don't remember him in in many ways because he came along at the end of the uh, big, big Red Machine era, and also he's not remembered that fondly because he was the first baseman that made Tony Perez expendable. Uh, Perez was Perez was traded after that 1976 uh, season, and part of the reason was they had Dan Dreesen waiting in the wings, um, and that was the end of the big red machine in some ways. All right, um, let's see who's next. Right field: Aristides Aquino. Aristides Aquino versus right fielder Dwayne Walker. This Whoa. is a push. <laughs> I, I want neither of these guys on my team. This is a push. The milk's gone bad. Center field, Nick Senzel versus center fielder Paul Householder. This is now this is perfect. Ooh. Two heralded prospects who did not pan out. So again, a push. I see a third base, Spencer Steer. Oh Ooh. no, here's here's where it goes off the rails. Third base, the 1982 Reds, Wayne Krinchicki. Oh no. God bless a milk cow, as someone I know once said. Wayne blanking Krinchicki. I think out of spite, you have to go with Spencer Steer. Spencer Steer is my favorite player now. <laughs> catcher Austin Romine Ugh. versus catcher Alex Trevino. 
think he played for also the Yankees close. this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neither one of those guys. No, thanks. Now starting pitchers, um, Starting pitchers for the starting pitcher for the Reds that day was Chase Anderson, of course, relieved by Ian Jabo and Buck Farmer. Oh. And then Alexis Diaz did come in, but for the nineteen eighty two Reds, starting pitcher Bob Shirley, Don't relieved by sure. exactly Ben Hayes, Joe Price, who blew the save and took the loss, and the animal Brad Leslie. So I don't know. Um, you could have Brad, just made up which years those folks were. Yeah. Two years from now, I would not. I won't remember the Injibo era. Oh or man, I hope that's Chase not true, man. That's Anderson Law era. That's sad. So to go back to the question, um, in a seven-game series between the 1982 and 22 two teams, who would win? I don't know who would win. I know who would lose. All of us. Having to watch that mess, we would yeah, be say, I, I know who wouldn't watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I probably say the twenty twenty two team probably wins. I think their pitching was better. Um, Can think, you imagine a field of dreams moment where you you build the field out of your corn, you give up your cash crop on the on the whims of a voice that you're hearing, and then after all is said and done, the nineteen eighty two and two thousand twenty two Reds come out and play. <laughs> <laughs> gosh so oh, field of nightmares <laughs> oh my goodness no thanks um so who's the mvp of the series wayne crinchicky clearly it's wayne crinchicky oh gosh rest in peace wayne crinchicky but i don't like you um, next question comes from our one of our good buddies from Canada at patreon.com slash riverfront sensi. Joey Gaditza. The land of Lincoln. Wait a minute. What? I'm not quite sure that's true. Um, what do you think about the fact that we have international uh, members of our family? I don't know that I approve of that. Should I mean, we tell our international our international members of the family to take a hike? If they live closer to Cincinnati, they probably wouldn't be Reds fans. Oh, good point. Good point. No, we love our international uh, members, including Joey Gaditza. When the Reds become significant again, he asks, who on the current roster will still be on the team? Now, you let me vamp a little while on the last question, so I'm going to let you answer this question, Nate. I'm just going to go down through the current roster. There's people that play, actually played on the Major League roster this year. I don't want to get into the minors, but Tyler Stevenson, easy. Jonathan India. Um, I'm assuming that they're going to give Kyle Farmer a lifetime contract. So probably Kyle Farmer. I see Sinzel being gone. Um, I think Spencer Steer is going to be there. I think that I'm going to be optimistic and say Jose Barreo is still going to be around. Um, Alejo Lopez is still going to be around because that's a guy that you can keep for cheap. Um offensively, I'm not sure that there's that many people that I would bank on. Mike Moustakis, no, I'm just kidding. Don't <laughs> don't send me any hate mail, guys. No death threats. Um, Pitching-wise, Alexis Diaz in the bullpen, and then the three young arms for sure, Green Lindolo and Ashcraft. I think that, that might kind of be it. Connor Overton, I don't know how long we have him under team control, but, you know, you got to have your staff ace. You know, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna add much to that. Uh, I think that's probably, I, I like the optimistic vision because what you're telling me is that you think they're gonna be competitive sometime in the near future. I hey. fear, I fear the actual answer is none of these guys. Um, but I'm not gonna say that. I'm not gonna say that, and even though I just said it, I'm gonna go with Nate. All those guys are gonna Joey Votto in the broadcast booth. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, now, yes, please, uh, Nate. Let me ask you something. When the Reds do become Good again. Are you going to be cheering for them, or are you going to be cheering for some other team by that time? I'm going to be cheering for the Reds to win games unless there's a chance that you get a tattoo. <laughs> okay. So what I'm hearing from you, though, is that even if the Reds are just kind of bad, not like 102 lost bads, you're still going to cheer for them. This is true. 
So are you telling me that you're basically cheering for laundry? The clothes are important to me, Chad. The clothes are important to you. Well, Nate, it's funny you mentioned that. Because today's <laughs> episode is sponsored by True Classic Tees. Hey, guys, can we talk about t-shirts? Um, really appreciate True Classic for coming on board here. F- you know, finding a, a perfect fitting shirt can be really difficult. I, I, mean, I understand this more than almost anyone. And, um, <laughs> and until I found True Classic Tees... And let me just tell you something. Oh, look at that. If you're watching on YouTube, Nate, with a True Classic Tees cap. I love it. But also... It kind of looks good on you. I'm wearing a True Classic tee. And you know what? They didn't send me this. I purchased this. I, You know, I, uh, Nate's, Nate's wearing a True... That's all Nate wears. True, look at that. Oh, man. You got to watch this on well. YouTube. Um, again, uh, we're really happy to partner with, with True Classic Tees because, frankly... <laughs> we literally wear them. You know, a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to get my uh, butt in shape. And uh, and I lost a lot of weight. Uh, and that's why we didn't have a video podcast before then. Okay. And uh, once I did, I said, I need to find a, a shirt, t-shirt that uh, that fits. That not just fits, but, you know, um, not too tight or, you know, doesn't have the bacon neck or whatever. Not just one of these big boxy tees. And so I landed on True Classic. And I'm telling you, um, Nate, I- I'll let you talk about them because you've been a fan longer than i have um but uh it's 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 actually good good stuff well i feel like it, go ahead nate you said it man I, I think if we were going to choose a company to sort of pop our advertising cherry if you will true classic is the one i've been rocking these guys for three years i have worn true classic on almost every episode that we have filmed of this show i wear them all the time I love them because not only they're comfortable, they make your guns look good. They turn a dad bod into a rad bod. Boom, boom, just came up with that on the cuff. <laughs> um, nah, tie, tie it around the guns, make you look good. I like them because when I don't know what to wear, I know that I can throw on some chinos, some nice slacks, and a true classic tee, and I'm going to look good. It's going to fit me right. And I'm not just BSing either. Like I, I wear them all the time. I am a, I'm a believer and guys, if you want to also get some True Classic, you can get 25% off by using the promo code RIVERFRONT. That's one word, RIVERFRONT, R-I-V-E-R-F-R-O-N-T, or going to trueclassic.com slash riverfront. Boom. And, and just before we get out of here, because we, we don't want to belabor it, but it's true. We, we you know, we, we've not had advertising in the history of this program and really, really excited uh, about this partnership because um, – because we do love the product. So again, we're going to get back to the viewer mail, but 25% off, use that promo code Riverfront. Go to trueclassictees.com slash Riverfront. You can get it as well. True. Uh, Nate. I just said true classic. Man. It's trueclassictees.com. Don't let me mess that up. Yes. And if you were watching yeah. on YouTube, you would have already known because we showed it on the screen. All right. Next question comes from our buddy, Kyle Kapler. I've been looking forward to answering this one. Um, Kyle's an old friend of ours. Welcome back to the, the family, Kyle. Um, and he asked a question that uh, I've seen him on Twitter kind of uh, espousing this a little bit. And it's an interesting it's an interesting question that I want to dig into. Kyle says this. OK, I think I'm ready to get this off my chest. Hot take. The Reds highly overachieved in 2021. 2021, of course, the year they were above 500. And were literally in the playoff race until September. They were relatively blessed with health until the end. And many, and I mean many in capital letters, players had career or resurgent years. They still barely finished over 500. Based on how many former players have performed this past season and how underwhelming their impact was on their current playoff team was, Suarez, who people were ready to move on from last, uh, ready to move on from last October and two months of Castillo aside, is it safe to assume that this is correct and that this year's team were destined to finish under 70 wins or so? Anyway, so Nate, do you understand the question here? I do, a, I do. We were lulled into a false sense of security because of the Reds overachieved last year, but uh, this year's team was going to be bad anyway. Under seventy wins, says Kyle. Um, now that's his that's his hot take. Um, I, let me just uh, unpack this for just a moment here, and then and then you can weigh in, Nate. Um, Certainly, I think that's an argument. I think it's a I, – I don't agree, but I think it's a legitimate argument. I don't, it's not one that I would reject 
you know, out of hand, Kyle. Um, I, I, I think that the things that you say are true in some ways. Now, the question is this, that this year's team was destined to finish under 70 wins or so anyway. I, I don't see that. I just don't see it. <laughs> under 70 wins. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty bad. I mean, we're talking mid nineties losses guaranteed. So going from a team that, uh, won 83 games, lost 79, and then going. And so we're talking a 15 game, essentially 15 game, 13, 14, 15 game drop. Even if we had the same players back, I, I'm not buying that. Now, again, that's not to say that your argument is, is incorrect because I don't think it necessarily is, um, because, you know, um, you're right that some players had career years. Uh, yeah, I guess who are we talking about? Nick Castellanos, who has not been great this year, but and Nick Castellanos was was he did have a career year last year. But now Nick Castellanos before last year was still a pretty good player, and I don't think anyone could have foreseen him kind of dropping off like he did this year. Uh, so, and maybe he would have in Cincinnati, but maybe he wouldn't have in Cincinnati. You know, I don't think we can say just because he went to Philadelphia and I don't think we say with any of these guys, just because they played how they did in other uh, other climbs, they would have done that as well. Jesse Winker's another one. Jesse Winker is not going to play like he did this year ever again, probably. Jesse Winker was a legit prospect who'd always gotten on base, always hit everywhere in the minors, and he's had an awful, awful year this year. So uh, I, I think maybe Suarez is not as good as he has been in uh, Seattle. But I, I just, I don't buy that Jesse Winker was destined to play like that in Cincinnati. But he played bad. If he did play that bad in Cincinnati, then yeah, okay, maybe they would have been bad. But, um, but, but no, I don't, I don't think so. If the Reds had just taken last year's team and returned that team, you can't tell me that team's not at least a, uh, a decent shot to be a 500 team. I mean, look at the rotation: Castillo, Malley, Wade Miley, Hunter Green, Nicolado. Your starters, Sonny Gray, Sonny Gray, right? I didn't mention Sonny Gray, right? That's your starters. That that you know, Castellanos is even if he's even if he's bad, maybe he's not that bad in Cincinnati, and maybe that's just me being a homer and being hopeful. Uh, hope is not a uh, what do I always say? Hope is not a strategy, but um, you know, uh, give me Castellanos and Winker over Aquino and Jake Fraley. I'm sorry, I don't care. <laughs> I just. I, and, and even if we have Winker and Castellanos, are they worse than what the Reds got in left field and right field this year? I mean, really, are they? I don't think so. I don't think – is there production? Oh, we'd have to go through and look. Um, the problem with the 2021 team, I don't think they overachieved. I think they were a team that was a legitimate uh, wild card competitive team, and um, the ownership just failed them by, uh, by not providing some money to go fix the bullpen in the season. So I don't agree with you, Kyle, but I'm not telling you that you're wrong. I think it's a really interesting argument and um, and it made me think a little bit, which I appreciate. Uh, and that's something I love about our, our Slack channel. Sometimes somebody else, someone will drop in there. Uh, my buddy Nathan, who is cheering for the Panthers tonight instead of the Islanders. I don't understand what that's all about. Sometimes it drops some contrarian takes on there and it's good. We talk and we discuss them and there's none of the nonsense you see on Twitter where you're an idiot. You're wrong. Um, Kyle, I don't think you're an idiot. Um, I mean, you may be. You can tell me if you are. I don't think you are. I've never seen anything to indicate that. Um, and I think it's an interesting interesting point here, but I just don't think I – I don't agree that they were destined to finish under 70 so wins. Were they destined to be a good team? Maybe not. Yeah, were they destined to make the playoffs this year? Maybe not. But just under 70 wins is a little tough for me to go to. All right, Nate, I kind of uh, rambled there for a little bit. Anything you want to add to that? The only thing I will add is that I think people discount – how difficult I imagine it must be to up and move to a new city in the middle of the off season or, or right before the season starts and then go and compete at the level that you want to. Jesse Winker, who lived in Cincinnati for a few years, Nick Castellanos, who'd been in Cincinnati for a couple of years. They were comfortable. They were comfortable in that park. They, they loved the dimensions. You know, Cincinnati is a hitter's park going to Seattle or Philadelphia. Not the same thing. And on top of that, the, you know, it's the personal things. Like you have to move your whole family. You have to move your entire life, depending how long you've been there. I think that carries a lot of baggage. So these guys that underperform in their, with their new teams, 
they might have not performed as well as they did in 2021 for the Reds if they stayed, but I don't think they would have fallen as far as they ended up doing if they were still in their comfort zone. So, yeah, I think the Reds this year without Castellanos would have been one of those teams hovering around 500 all year long, waiting on a hot streak that did or did not come. To Kyle's point, Jesse Winker had his best year of his career last year. Um, Nick Castellanos had the best year of his career last year. I mean, he, it's not uh, it's not crazy talk, but if we run it back with that same group, are the Reds really going to be 15 games worse? I just I don't see it. I don't think see of the, it. But think of the chemistry that team, the energy that team had, and I know that doesn't necessarily equate to wins, but compared to what we saw trotted out 162 times this season, it's, it's hard for me to believe that that team wouldn't have been 10 or 15 wins better. Yeah, I, I think, frankly, we uh, this probably deserves some more thought and discussion, um, but and I don't know if we'll ever get around to it. But I, I, I still believe, maybe unjustifiably, but I still believe that you just add up – let's run it back with that same team from last year except add a bullpen, and that's a wild card team to me. That's, I, I, still, I still believe it. I, I will always believe it. Um, but I'm an idiot, so uh, unlike Kyle, so you know. And here we are in uh, mid-October, rooting for wild cards. <laughs> I'll take it, man. I'll take it. We are literally, we are literally daydreaming about a wild card run. <laughs> oh, what a time to be alive! That's Seth Shaner, of a team, Bob. There we go, Seth Shaner. Seth uh, has what? Uh, what our buddy Rich Thompson, who has a question in a moment, uh, in a moment. Uh, that he, they have the same thing, which is a little difficulty in being concise. It's okay. We love you. But, uh, you know, uh, nobody wants to listen to me talk. Actually, everyone wants to listen to me talk. That's why all of you are here. Uh, you're not here for Nate. I mean, come on. No one's That's here for the, Nate. The YouTube viewers are here for all me. Right. The YouTube viewers are here to look at Nate um, instead of me. we got to come up with some kind of – maybe on our YouTube video, we should just – it should just be you. And uh, and no one else. Uh, they can hear my voice, but just look at you. Seth asks this. I've been thinking about different levels of fandom lately. On one level, you have the Reds, where being a fan means resigning yourself to ineptitude and owner malfeasance. Diehard such as ourselves may have trouble explaining why we continue to punish ourselves through the long, hard slog of a 162-game season. The Bengals only recently seem to offer more hope as nearly every game Joe Burrow starts is at worst competitive and at best, awesome. By the way, listen to the Riverfront Bengals show. We had a lot of fun this week. I actually joined Nate on that. Uh, go look for it wherever you get your podcast. The Riverfront Bengals show, man. That is That was fun. Um, and I found a way to work UVA football into it. Uh, it's a fun brand of football, even when we resort to questioning play calling and the type of nitpicking things that are only possible if your team is, you know, actually in the game. And then there's Ohio State football. I'm a fan and an alum, and I know not every Reds fan shares my combination of fanhood, but being an OSU fan means watching semi-boring affairs for much of the season. Last week's road game at Michigan State was over before halftime. Bless your heart, Seth. Was over before halftime, and the fourth quarter featured a bunch of runs up the middle to run the clock out. They're so good that only one or two regular season games will be competitive. My question is this. Where is that level of peak enjoyability? I suppose in baseball, where even the best teams play close games and lose sometimes, being in the hunt all the time would be the most fun. Thoughts? Uh, it's it's a great uh, kind of uh, mental exercise here. Uh, I don't. I'm a University of Virginia football fan and alum. And buddy, you can take a hike, Seth. Uh, <laughs> um, Virginia got killed by Duke. Um, so I, I think there's some something to be said for a team that is in the mix like OSU and uh, the OSU. And uh, even if some of those games are semi-boring affairs, whatever, you get a chance to hang out with your friends and watch a fun game and they win big. And then you got a chance to win the big games at the end of the season. There's some to that. I think peak enjoyability is the question. I hate to say it this way. is It has to be the, uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. Best fans in baseball, but man, they're they're in the mix every single year. How is that not the most fun? You're always in the mix. You don't win always, but you always have a chance to win. I don't know. Um, again, this is getting back to uh, to cheering for laundry, but but Nate, do you have any thoughts about the uh, fandom and the uh, you know um, Seth's question? I am going to zag slightly from the Cardinals because who wants to root 
for neck tattoos. Just kidding. I don't care about tattoos. Get tattoos wherever you want. I think for me, peak enjoyment would be because I get what he's saying. If you're the if you're the Yankees or I guess the early 2000s Yankees or the current iteration of the Dodgers, and you expect to win every year, there's a pretty big disappointment that comes with only winning in a COVID season. Hashtag asterisk World Series Dodgers fans. I think peak enjoyment comes from the Atlanta Braves, at least the last 30 years. I mean, dominant through the 90s, only one World Series, but man, I mean, you're in it every year and you got that one. You only want it the once, so it, you don't take it for granted. Um, this current iteration, they won last year and an incredible run that involved several like inner circle, incredible baseball games. And then you get to root for a team that is locking up youngsters for the next better part of a decade. I mean, what better what better thing to experience as a fan than getting a World Series and the response to that World Series a couple of years prior and now in the season that follows, being right in the thick of, thick of things again and locking up these young people, giving you something to root for. I posted something on Twitter the other day just saying, like, dear, whoever's making the decisions, like, they just locked up Spencer Strider. Like, if we, if we locked up Hunter Green and and somebody made the fair point, like, I get the sentiment, but, like, if those guys had performed as well as Strider had, I'd feel better about it. I've said, hey, my argument is simple. Give me something to be happy about. Give me anything that I can, like, tangibly say, this brings me joy. So peak enjoyment, Atlanta's doing that. You get a World Series and have given you something to be excited about for the next eight years, several somethings to be excited about. No, I think, I think it's, I think it's good. And it, it's actually similar to my argument for the Cardinals. And so I'm going to, I'm going to veer because I hate the Cardinals so much. And God I'm, I'm yeah, once he, re- once he retires, you know, no, we're still going to hate him, but maybe not, maybe not with as much intensity. Uh, I hate Yadier Molina with the white hot intensity of a thousand suns. I mean, I just despise that guy. Um, but the Braves are similar in, in except in, from, from the rest perspective, they're doing the thing I've been at, begging the rest to do for years, which is locking up those young guys. I love that. But mm-hmm. it's different than the Dodgers or the Yankees who are spending all that money. That'd be fun. But, you know, you're kind of bullying your way uh, to to, uh, to relevance, which is, again, I, if I am if I was a Dodgers fan, I'd be completely happy with it. It's sort of similar to Ohio State in some ways, frankly. Um, you know, the Dodgers uh, <laughs> spending lots of money, beating up a bunch of people, and then maybe not gonna- coming through in the end. But they got a great farm system, though. That's true. They they do. They have a great major league team and spend a bunch of money, and they also have a great farm system. So, anyway, fandom, man, we could we could do an hour on fandom. Next we question, probably, for, we probably will in the off season. <laughs> that's right. We'll be looking for something that actually is a great topic. Uh, it, we could probably expand upon. Next question comes from our friend Sydney Price. Sydney Price asks, "How do y'all again? Another y'all? They, they the family knows how to write these questions." for my dulcet tones. How do y'all expect UVA to do this year in hoops? Oh, Sydney, thank you. Do you have a preference between UC and XU? Go Reds. So let's take those uh, uh, two different ways. I'm incredibly excited about the University of Virginia basketball season. I look for every opportunity to talk about that on the show. Um, This is going to be the best UVA team since the 2019 NCAA National Champions. Now, they're not going to be as good as that team but they're going to be the best Virginia team since that team. Also the turn basic national champions. Uh, that's true. They were the defending national champions and they, well, no one won a, a championship other than Virginia <laughs> until 2021. Um, they're going to be good. And Kihei Clark is back for his ninth season to play point guard. And it's just, it's terribly exciting. So I cannot wait for the basketball season to start because football season has been so bad. Uh, and now baseball season's over. Um, Nate, uh, do you have any thoughts on UVA basketball quickly? Uh, I will kind of pay attention to it. If UVA is relevant, then I'll pay more attention. I am much, much, much more of an NBA fan. And watching college basketball pains me. No, oh, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. College basketball is the one and done. greatest one and, sport in America. One and done ruined it for college basketball. Oh, my gosh. Get out of here. You're crazy. You've lost your mind. All right, write this down. This is another episode this offseason. The best era of college basketball involved Trajan Langdon. That's all I'm going to say. And I don't even like Duke. All right, look. 
you know, I've been sort of accommodating to listen to your nonsense on this show. If you're going to start talking about Duke basketball, we're going to have a problem. It is inarguable that that was a good era for college basketball. Dudes played three or four years before they went pro. You got to root for guys for forever. You felt invested. College Which, basketball now, you get them for one year and they're gone. Unless you're UVA. It's actually not true, Nate. I'm going to push back on you. Push. It's not true now because of name, image, and likeness. Players are sticking around longer than they have in years in college basketball because instead of going to Europe, you can you know play for Kentucky and be the national player of the year and make, you know, uh, six, seven figures. Well, now. this is so, year, this is year two of the NIL rules, and Bronny just got a high school deal. So let's see how this plays out. Well, I just uh, you know I'm all for the players getting paid, and it's making college basketball a stronger game. The great players. I hope the, so. The, I hope so. Well, the, you know, after UVA's twenty, gosh, we don't need to get into this. But after UVA's 2019 championship, they had three guys go to the NBA. Uh, two of them were drafted in the first round, so good for them. A third was drafted late in the second round. He's a guy that would have come back to Virginia if he were able to make that much money. May, I think he would have come back to Virginia. Nowadays, these argument, guys are – There's an argument that two of them would have come back. Right. There's an argument that two of them, Ty Jerome and, and Kyle Guy, if they could have made the same amount of money. I don't know. Uh, Ty Jerome was drafted in the middle of the first round, so he probably goes. But the guys that are drafted in the sec- would be drafted in the second round now are not going anymore. They're coming back. Oscar Sheboy for Kentucky, I know a lot of you all are, are Kentucky fans, is a perfect example. Uh, not a great fit for the current NBA, but he can come back and make a ton of money and maybe be uh, player of the year again. So I think we're actually in for a renaissance and stupid Coach K retired, so maybe Duke will go into the garbage dumpster. Um, hey, so you know what? I, I hope you're right, but I'm going to leave it up to the viewers. Let me know, Cincinnati or Xavier, I'm a free agent. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a free agent fan. So I actually grew up a Kansas Jayhawk fan. That's a little, little known fact. I was the youngest of four, four, four of these brothers that we have. And I remember being really little. And this is, I think, before you went to the University of Virginia, obviously before I went to the University of Virginia. And the tournament comes on. My big brothers are getting super excited about the tournament. And I'm a little bro trying to fit in. I say, I want to watch. I want to watch. Who do I root for? And Chad told me, well, sit down, watch the first two days with me and decide who you like. And I chose the Kansas Jayhawks, a point guard named Rex Walters. Yep. I, I just latched on. And it worked out pretty well for me. But then it I did. went to UVA, and with all the recruiting things going on, it became hard for me to stick with Kansas when I had some UVA DNA. But now I'm back, and I love UVA, I love Tony Bennett. But they're boring. So I'm a free agent. I put myself back on the open market. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Cincinnati or Xavier, you guys let me know who to root for. Literally. This is literally the only Cincinnati Reds podcast that talks about the University of Virginia this much. It's really not good. It's not good for our brand, Nate. Um, UC versus Xavier. Okay, let me just quickly talk about that. Um, Because I do have a preference that I don't really say it out loud very often. Because we have UVA fans. I mean, uh, UC fans. We have Xavier fans here. But, you know, I have two college teams, and everybody yells at me about this, but I went to both schools. So I can claim both of these schools, and actually one of these schools, uh, not UVA, is the team I cheered for growing up as a kid, Uh, and that's Georgetown. Georgetown, who did not win a single game in the Big East last year because they had the worst coach in the history of college basketball. Maybe the greatest player in the history of college basketball, the worst coach, Patrick Ewing. Um, So I I have a little bit of difficulty picking Xavier here because, although I like a lot of things about Xavier's program, what they've done over the years, but they're in the Big East with Georgetown. So, Nate, if I have a, uh, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna push you towards UC probably um, because of that. But we'll yeah we'll let the we'll let the uh, the viewers slash listeners decide on that. Nate's a free agent; he wants a team. So, um, if 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 you go for Xavier, you got to cheer against Georgetown twice a year. That actually that yeah. actually might be a might be a Easiest decision I've never made. <laughs> Hoya Saxa. Oh, my goodness. Rich Thompson. Rich, uh, here, here comes Rich's question. I'm going to try to get through it. I don't completely understand it, um, okay. <laughs> and it's long. But, Rich, you know. You know we love you, buddy. Gentlemen, 
I have read some recent articles that Reds management, by all accounts, will not be making any investments to improve the team this offseason. Additionally, I've read that Reds management will seek to reduce payroll further, perhaps. So it looks like 2023 will be another grin and bear it season for the Reds and for us, the fans. Plus, where, where are you going to go since I'm in a committed relationship to the Reds? Therefore, I feel as a self-imposed hostage to the Reds, I need a little extra humor in my life, much like we have with the Selva Team Bob campaign and billboard, until the Reds are competitive again. So with all this said, now here's where we here's where we get into it. I, uh, Rich, I don't know, man. <laughs> Excuse me there. With all this said, I'm wondering if the musical parody genius, Weird Al Yankovic, see, now you didn't see that coming. I did not. I don't care if you've been listening to us <laughs> from episode one, and here we are at 448. You didn't see it coming that we were going to veer off into Weird Al Yankovic. Would Weird Al maybe be interested in developing a smash hit song and video around the debacle of our beloved Reds? Maybe the title could be, Hey, Where Are You Gonna Go? Um, and I don't understand. Uh, is is that a, is there like a popular song that you could maybe make that a parody for? Um, he sent me a, a, a video of Weird Al Yankovic living with a hernia, <laughs> which I guess is living in America maybe. <laughs> Living with a hernia. <laughs> anyway, he says, oops, strike this idea. I just realized Phil Kessling might have a copyright to that catchphrase, and Weird Al might have to pay him royalties to use it. Rich, I can't answer that question. It's the wildest question we've ever had, and I love it. I love you for it. Nate, what, what do you think, Weird got. Al? <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your existence, Rich. Keep them coming. But I, uh, I love I it. A, I had another busy work day today. and was not able to do my usual preparation for this podcast, and that question required some preparation. <laughs> uh, did you Did you know there's a, a Weird Al Yankovic uh, biopic movie coming out? Isn't it starring Harry Potter? Harry Potter as Weird Al. Good for him. Good for him. He survived. He did survive. Even spoiler though spoiler alert. No nose. Spoiler alert. <laughs> no, got that guy with no nose. Tried to get him, but he did. Um, all right, last question, uh, man. We haven't even got to our Twitter questions yet, Nate. We gotta, get, we gotta get moving. We'll here. rapid fire. We're good. Yeah. If anybody's, James if Scott. Anybody, listen, if anybody's hanging in this long, then they're fine lasting a little bit longer. <laughs> they're yeah, ready that, to go on this train ride with us. That's right. Absolutely. It's not a, really a train ride. It's, it's a roller coaster, man. It's up and down, peaks and valleys. It's James train wreck. Train wreck yes. <laughs> James Scott Pyle, if the Braves don't win the World Series this year, then the 1975-76 Reds will be the only National League team to win back-to-back -back World Series in 100 years. It's only happened three times ever. Is this a good reason to root against Atlanta? Uh, first of all, I didn't realize. I assume that's true. I'm not going to look it up. I, I'm not going to do that much work. But, um, man, the only National League team to win back-to-back -back World Series in 100 years, that's kind of uh, kind of amazing. So, yeah, I think that is a good reason to root against Atlanta, Nate. What do you think? I disagree. I think the fact that neither of us have ever known that that is the truth means it's an irrelevant statistic. It's cool. I don't hate it. But compared to all the other teams that you can root for or against in this postseason, that's not a good reason to root against this Braves team. Well, um, but I appreciate the other side. If you say that is a good reason, I get it. Yeah, I disagree with you. I, I'm with James. I, I want the Reds to be uh, the only team. <laughs> Again, not that I've ever heard that stat anywhere. That I, I don't know. But if, if anyone ever said that, like on a national broadcast, I want it to be the Reds. So, yes, I think that is a good reason. The next question is one of our, uh, our fans on Twitter, Jason Heimer, at Jason Heimer1. Reds fan in Atlanta here. I wanted to kind of pair these two questions. Reds fan in Atlanta here. As much as I've disliked the Braves over the years, they are a fun team to watch, have a talented young core, and I found myself cheering them on this postseason. Truist Park isn't too shabby either. Do I need an intervention? You know, I got to say, um, I'm cheering for the Braves because of James's question a moment ago, cheers against them. But uh, And I disagree about Truist Park. I think it's the only average. I mean, I liked it. It was fine. Um but man, they're a fun young team, and I, Ronald Acuna, yeah, I mean, I, I I have very few objections to the Atlanta Braves, and I I can't believe that I'm uh, I'm saying that. Nate, what do you think? 
First off, I want to say that these questions come from our Twitter followers. You said fans. You can't. We cannot confirm these people are fans. <laughs> That's true. Good point. They could hate follow us, which I would understand more than actually being a fan. Um, no, I, 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 I think it's a great idea. Jason, be a Reds fan first and foremost. But if you live in Atlanta, catch the fever, man. I mean, they are running that organization the right way. They're not doing anything that I – can point to that I should say, hey, this is this is why we should dislike them. And I haven't been to Truist Park yet, but my, the Braves fans in my life started out hating it, but came around in a big way. I'm hearing that it's a pretty awesome park with a lot going on around the park. I don't know that that is true, but I'm hearing good things. So I think you should go and have a second favorite team. I think it's fine. Whenever they play the Reds, you have to root for the Reds. If they play a game that impacts the Reds, you have to root against them. But in the meantime, have fun. No, no, no I think that's reasonable. Uh, Truist Park, I think, around the stadium, a lot of fun stuff. Uh, the stadium was good, just not great, I, I didn't think. Um, I've only been there once, though, so I, I, I can't really speak with much authority. Here's what I'll say, Nate. Here's what we're doing. If the Braves do make the World Series, though, if the Braves make the World Series – we're going to have a special guest on this uh, on this program. Um, you, you know that uh, there are four of us, four Dotson brothers. Two of us are on here right now. Um, one of the four is a Braves fan for some reason. Actually, he'll, he'll explain why if we ever have him on the show. It's because I was a Reds fan, and, and he was the one that's next in age to me, and we grew up fighting each other all the time. And uh, so he did, would not pick the same team I picked. He deliberately went, he veered. In every sport, he was that way. So, um, so our brother, we're going to bring our brother, the Braves fan on. If the, if the Braves make the world series, we're going to do that. What do you think? Is that a bad idea? It might be a bad idea. Actually. We might need to have a monitor. We need to watch his prep. <laughs> have, have a sensor involved. Maybe maybe do it on a five second delay. So we can yeah, have, we definitely have a delay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, the rest of these questions come from, we'll try to do them as in a rapid fire fashion. If we can, all of our, uh, followers at uh, twitter.com and this is at riverfront sensi you can follow us on twitter at riverfront sensi would be happy if you did that first coming from mike petrie at the mike petrie he's not a mike petrie he's the mike petrie you want to know yes and he answered a question that's really difficult he asked a question that's really difficult but we're gonna whatever what's the ideal breakdown of player acquisition on a roster for example what percentage of the team should be promoted for the minor leagues on rookie deals Homegrown players retained post free agency and major league free agent signings, major league players acquired via trade. Man, I, I, I don't even know how to answer that, Mike, um, because I think the real answer is there's no ideal breakdown. The idea is that you use all of those methods of acquiring good players, promoted from the minor leagues, homegrown players retained post free agency, major league free agent signings, major league players acquired via trade. You, you take all of those. And you mix and match, however your uh, you know your your budget allows, and uh, uh, put together a team. So I don't know that there is an ideal breakdown. I like that you know the Reds are leaning heavily into the, the you know the minor leagues and and building from within, and that's that's great. That's fine. You can't win just doing that. You just can't win consistently just doing that. Um, I just I'll never believe that you can you can actually be a, a competitive team long term while doing that. So uh, you have to have some mixture of all those. Nate, I don't know if you have any uh, any thoughts on that. That's a difficult question, Mike. Thank you for it, but I don't think there's a real answer to it. I love the question, and I feel bad that I don't have a better answer. So here's what I'm going to throw out there, Mike. I need more time. So if Chad will indulge me at a later date, I would like to have an episode over the over the winter where we come up with what's called a 150 million dollar budget which is you know somewhere in that like middle tier middle market range and we come up with what a Cincinnati Reds team would look like what the 2023 Cincinnati Reds team will look like if the Reds decide to spend 130 million dollars next year and see how that compares to some of the other contenders i think that right. could give us a good idea Request denied, Nate. Yeah. Shoot. 
<laughs> Doug Gray is our next question at Doug Dirt Twenty Four. Mom and Dad are not listening anymore. We're fine. Yeah, they're not listening this long. Yeah, no, there's no question about that. Doug Gray asks, "Why is Phil Razor?" That's at PSR nineteen seventy three. So if you're on Twitter, go to Twitter and make a point not to follow at PSR nineteen seventy three. I follow him, but anyway. Why is Phil Razor not on the podcast more? Everyone knows Razor equals downloads. Um, he's not on the he's not same reason that we don't bring our other brother on. We don't have a delay button here where you can in case he says something outrageous. Uh, Nate, I know you're not that familiar with Phil Razor, but he likes to get into fights with uh, with elderly people. Well, I don't know, but if um, if Razor equals downloads, and we are going to enter into a partnership with True Classic Tees. Mm. Phil, there might be a spot for you, my friend. Ooh, not a bad idea. Look, uh, promo code Riverfront, 25% off. Um, <laughs> True Classic Tees. Okay, Phil, you're invited on over the offseason. You decide when you want to be on. Uh, see, now here, here, what I'm doing here is I'm testing uh, to see if Phil's listened this long Does he listen? into the show. If he hasn't listened this long into the show, and do not alert him, none of you are allowed to alert him. If he has listened this far into the show and no one has alerted him to this, I'll have him on at some point during the offseason. Um, next comes from our friend and, and frequent guest to the show, Carlos Guevara. You all know Carlos. Carlos from our, our friends over at the Late Night Reds Talk uh, show. Um, Carlos asked this question, who is the better baseball player of the Dotson brothers? Ooh. Please include career wins above replacement and each of your MLB comps. So the uh, now Nate, let me just before we answer this one, are we talking about just you and I? Because he says the Dotson brothers or all four Dotson brothers. Actually, I think the answer is probably still the same. But the answer is the same. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the answer? The best of baseball player of the Dotson brothers. I am definitely the best baseball player of the Dotson brothers. As long as you don't bring the uh, the, the the children. The next generation, I think your son might surpass me. I was an extremely mediocre baseball player. I was fine. Started for a couple of years, maybe like a one, a one win above replacement per season kind of guy. <laughs> no, but you were a legit starter. You were legit. I mean, you were a, you were a legit high school baseball player. I mean, uh, you're the only of the Dotson brothers that was a legit high school baseball player. So, so, I mean, so it's second cool. second team all district. Honorable mention. There you go. All region. Yeah. And the, and, and the worst district for sports in America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my son is hoping he surpasses you this year, I, definitely. But uh, we'll see. He's uh, going to be a senior this year. Um, and had a really good junior year. Uh, no, it's not It's it's not even close. Uh, my I've told the story a couple times. My baseball career in high school, uh, we had a, like a, a legendary high school baseball coach. And um, he's in the Virginia High School League Hall of Fame. I mean, like maybe the best high school baseball coach literally in the history of uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And he made a really, as I was kind of coming up, he made a really good, uh, I don't know, he really convinced me to trust his judgment in terms of my baseball career. And he really went leaned hard into convincing me to go out for the tennis team. And so I did that. I went out for the tennis team and <laughs> had a really good high school tennis career after really wanting to be a, a baseball player. Now, uh, my my comp was uh, – <laughs> here we go. My comp as a high school baseball player, although I didn't finish my career, I moved over to the courts, but was um, Wayne Krenchicki. All field, no hit, third baseman. I was also a catcher, but um, I was I – was, I couldn't hit. I could play the field. I was – you know, I couldn't. Once, once they was, started throwing curveballs, man, I just uh, – that was – I couldn't do it. I was Jesse Winker if you flip-flop the uh, the power for defense. No power, great defense, good average, high on-base percentage. Oh, yeah. Yeah, left field. That that? Yeah. Uh, that's a good comp. So, um, let me ask you handsome. this question. <laughs> the, the most handsome, certainly, of the Dawson brothers. There's no question about that. I mean, that's far and away. Um, yeah, but who was the best basketball player of the Dawson brothers? Because we all played on the basketball team as well. Who had the best high school career or who had the best peak? <laughs> Is there a difference? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, we had a brother, Jordan, who came like a, a hair from making the walk-ons for UVA's squad. So that's, that's true. Cool. That's true. I had a really yeah. good intramural game once. 
Um, the only la- only other thing I'll say because we're getting into Dotson again. I really, I, I, um, no one cares this. No one's even listening at this. If they're point. an hour and twenty minutes in. We can talk about whatever we want. <laughs> Let me tell you about That's crypto. Right. How you feel about <laughs> Shiba Inu coin? <laughs> That's right. Um, my my the highlight of my high school baseball career. I just wanted to mention this quickly. Our aforementioned brother, who's a Braves fan, he was uh, when I was a senior in high school. He was, I guess, a sophomore, and he was on the varsity baseball team. And this was – I'd already moved over to the tennis team at that point. But it was it was an early season game, baseball game. And um, I had just finished my senior year of basketball, and we'd had a good team. And, I, you know, we'd had a good season. You know, we lost in the regional semifinals, whatever. Um, but uh, my brother, our brother, scored the winning run in an early season game. And in the local paper the next day, it was plastered all over the local paper about how, uh, well, anyway, it put my name in for his. It said I scored the winning run. So the highlight of my baseball career was to be able to take credit because the reporter had followed the basketball team all season. I, I guess he thought it was me. <laughs> but uh, getting credit for him scoring the uh, the game-winning run. So that was my highlight, baseball, the highlight of my high school baseball career is that I wasn't even involved. So anyway. Oh, boy. I, I, I'm going to cut this out. This is ridiculous. Carlos, so here this. If you're here this long, they're along for the ride. Carlos, go Kenny, Padres. Go Padres. Yes. Yes. Um, Kenny Peters at – this is a good, this is a good uh, Twitter name, Twitter handle. At Ghetto Doofy. At Ghetto Doofy. I'm literally following you right now because that name is awesome. Ghetto, spelled as you would expect it to be, Doofy, D-O-O-F-Y. Everyone, go follow at Ghetto Doofy. Although, I don't know, if you get there and he's like, all of his tweets are like insane nonsense. Maybe, maybe don't. Maybe, make sure he doesn't have any uh, scary uh, political make opinions. That, I don't make know. Make that decision on your own. Like, go yes. check it out and make that decision. Exactly. His question is this. Where does Kyle Farmer rank amongst the grittiest Reds players of all time? Not the greatest, but the grittiest Reds players of all time. I have him as a he, he's certainly top five and maybe even uh maybe even top two, but I don't think he can be more than number two in, in my list. Do you have any gritty Reds players that come to mind quickly, Nate? I'll tell you who I think is number one if, if you don't have anyone that comes to mind. Keith Brill jumps out, number one to me. When I think of gritty Reds players, Keith Brill, number one. Hold on, hold on a second, hold on, hold on. Stop. You dove into a wall. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Keith Friel was a three-point marksman right. from UVA. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Friel is the guy Ryan you're thinking Friel. of. UVA basketball three-point superstar, Keith Friel. Exactly. Right. There you go. Uh, versus Ryan Friel. Ryan Friel was gritty. Ryan Friel. Ryan Friel. Yeah, Ryan Friel is ahead of – he's ahead of uh, – he's not number one, but he's ahead of uh, – Kenny Peters has uh, one follower. <laughs> we got to change that, guys. Everyone, go follow him. Nate, go his, log on to the, the red leg. His pin tweets. No other tweets. He's only replied. I'm very confused. <laughs> All right, we're gonna we're gonna get into this in a later episode. Don't follow Ghetto <laughs> Doofy. Doofy. Ghetto Doofy. Oh my gosh, what is going on here? It's out of control. Um, the my my number one grittiest pl- Reds player in history is Skip Schumacher, noted for his oh, grittiness. Fired. Skip Schumacher. You're fired. Okay. Please, please fire me. I have better things to do on Thursday nights. I don't, I don't Keep really. Real. Sad Keep about this. Was awesome. All right, one last question. I wasn't going to do this one because he didn't follow our rules that were that were in the uh, when we posted on Twitter.com. That's at Riverfront Cincy, but it's fly in the Vaseline. <laughs> this is at- people are making up names, <laughs> Twitter handles. <laughs> I am. Yeah, listen to this one. At Will Lou 514-64805. So essentially he has his phone number in there, I think. And 867. Will Lou 8675309. Um and here's the question. This is a good one to finish because we're already off the rails. How do you fold your socks and organize your sock drawer? <laughs> that is assuming you have a sock only drawer, as some like myself have a sock drawer that is shared with a box or breeze because we aren't big money like yourself. Oh, yeah, we got the big podcast money. We don't we don't combine drawers. Do you ball your socks up together or sock clips? Nate, I'm gonna have to ask you a question. What I am of a certain age, of a certain vintage. What what are sock clips? I, I don't know what that is. I was hoping are you there, would tell me. <laughs> I've never heard of that. 
Oh. Is it something that rich people have? Do I need to acquire some so that I appear wealthy? I'll do that. How is there, how do you, other than just balling them up together, how, I don't understand how you. Googling it in real time. Okay, Google that while I uh, while I say this. Um, yes, I want to tell you, my friend, this. it is a clothesline for socks that you put in your closet. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> what? How is that it even is, a thing? It is worse than you want it to be. The how original that solution for matching pairing and lost socks, according to SockClick.com. Not sponsored by SockClip.com, by the way. <laughs> no, no. And, and if SockClip.com tried to sponsor the show, we tell them to take a hike. Not worth it. Not worth it. True classic tees only. Um, 25% off promo code Riverfront. Um, so I'll just quickly, my, my, my sock drawer is not just a sock drawer. Although actually, hmm. I moved recently and before we moved, I did just have a sock drawer by itself, but now it's combined with uh, with uh, the underpants, underoos. The I have some Star Wars underoos, mm -hmm. Super Friends underoos. Super. Um. So, but anyway, uh, so I I have the socks on the left side, the underpants on the right side, and the socks balled up. Nate, what do you, what about you? Very little rhyme or reason. I have a one of those drop down closet organizers. The top two left sections. The top one is all of my tennis shoe socks and my dress socks. The section below is all of my comfy winter. I need to keep my feet warm socks. And that's how I got it worked out. That's completely ludicrous. I I do not support your sock uh, sorting. Well, I can't imagine why. Cause I don't know. It's you're, you're just it's an hour and a half into a <laughs> yeah. No, we're done. We got to get out. We're done. We're both going to get divorced. Um, I'm uh, if if uh, well, uh, I will get divorced. You will get pre-divorced. I don't know if we don't get off here probably. So, yikes! How do we let this go so long, Nate? Give me your final thoughts in answer to that question. <laughs> I got nothing left, man. This is actually a blast, and I think we should scrap talking about the Reds for the foreseeable future and only do viewer mail episodes. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, man. Uh, this, this actually was a lot of fun. I hope that uh, all of you all had as much fun as we did. Thanks to everyone for uh, hanging out with us all season long. Um, we have been trying every week to figure out a way to have fun during this uh, crazy season. Season's over now, but uh, I, I expect that we're going to continue to have fun all off season. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening to and supporting the rear front. However you support us. If it's just, you know, if it's listening on the, the free feed every week. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, subscribe to the show on YouTube in your favorite podcast app. We're going to be there always uh, free every single Friday morning. You'll have us. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We're at Riverfront Sensi on all those platforms. And then uh, I do have to say once again, a huge thank you to our supporters at patreon.com slash riverfront sensi. This show would literally not be possible without the support of our Patreon family. And we would love for you to join in our hijinks uh, over there. Just go to patreon.com slash riverfront sensi, click the link in the show notes. Um, you know, I got to say, do. big shout out, big thank you to the Bro Chachos over at True Classic Tees for supporting the podcast. Yeah. And we're not going to become some crazy, uh, you know, uh, advertisements every five seconds, but. We really, kinda, we're really, we're really, really happy. Yeah, we're really happy to have those guys on board, and and thanks to them. Go, go, go to go over there, and uh, you know, use the promo code. Anyway, for Nate Dotson and Asher Wojciechowski. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Pump the brakes. Chad Dotson saying, "So long, everyone." <laughs>